Tokyo, Japan, in my tiny, tiny, tiny apartment in Shin Okubo. I'm in Tokyo. 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 I'm not exactly sure when I'll post this video because I'm still waiting for a violin track from my friend Daniel Garlitsky. Allez, Monsieur Garlitsky! I'm waiting to be Garlitskied. This is also my first video of the year. And before I start talking about Django and his birthday, what he means to me, I want to talk to you about this、uh, Taipei Gypsy Jazz Festival that's happening in the month of March. I'll be playing double bass, not guitar. And、uh, I'll be playing with Duvet and his Transatlantic Five. So、uh, please check it out. There are going to be jam sessions, workshops, and a concert with Duvet and myself and our buddies. By the way, this guitar, I'll make a promo video for it eventually. But this is an AT guitar made in Japan by Atsushi Takano in Tochigi Prefecture. This guitar is amazing. I love it.、Um, I, I, I first played this guitar a year ago and I fell so much. I fell in love with it. I just had to buy it. So thank you so much, Mr. AT. <coughs> All the important things in music I learned from Django. And to be honest, without him, I don't know if I'd have a career in music today. It's, I owe absolutely, absolutely everything in my musical life to him. A few years ago, his grandson David Reinhardt contacted me and asked me to help him organize、uh, the Reinhardt Family Camp, which takes place during the Django Festival in France, the, formerly, the festival formerly known as Django Reinhardt Samoa Festival, or whatever the official name was, I don't know. Anyway,、um, for the first edition,、uh, I told David I couldn't take any money from him because. As I said, I got everything from his grandfather, and it was the least I could do for his, for his, for his family. So, Django, thank you, thank you, thank you. When I discovered his music right after high school, I knew right away that this is what I wanted to do. I'm talking about that way of playing guitar.、Um, we can call it gypsy jazz if you want, and actually, I, I really don't like that term. For many reasons, and I'll eventually make a video about that one day. But let's just call it that. Let's simplify. Let's call it a gypsy jazz guitar. So, upon discovering Django, I finally saw light. Whereas before, in my teenage years, I was still fairly serious about music, but I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do with it. With Django, boom, it was just very clear what I, what I had to do. There was suddenly The path was laid out before my eyes. So, to make a long story short, Django taught me how to listen to music. He also dispelled so many music education myths.、Uh, someone who knew practically nothing about music theory knew no scales, no arpeggios, in, in technical terms rather, but who was creating some of the most beautiful. And also, most harmonically sophisticated music out there. And how is that possible? If you're anything like me,、um, when I was younger, a lot of people were telling me, okay, you gotta practice your modes, you gotta practice your scales, your arpeggios. Yet, you had, here you had someone like Django who didn't do anything like that. And I soon found out later that there were a lot of musicians from Django's era, jazz musicians, not just jazz, but other styles, who were the same. They were creating such beautiful music without having really practiced scales or arpeggios or things like that. How is that possible? And I, I noticed this because when you know, all these scales and everything, I did that one in my teenage years. And when I tried to play this gypsy jazz style, everything I played was correct, but it didn't sound good at all. And how is that possible? I was playing everything right. And so that, that's the kind of stuff I want to talk to you about. And I remember back in the day, I was trying to look for a teacher to, to help me understand Django's music, and I couldn't find anyone. 
uh, eventually I did meet someone from Paris who knew some basics of swing rhythm and I spent like a summer with him and he taught me a lot about rhythm but for the most part I was on my own so Django taught me how to listen why is that because since no one wanted to teach me I had to just go straight to the recordings and with my beginner years try to make sense of what he was doing I'll be the first to admit that I didn't always understand everything that he did but I did my best this opened a lot of doors for me because for the first time I wasn't thinking in terms of scales or arpeggios but really thinking in terms of music melodic ideas I started learning tunes I learned a whole bunch of tunes and my ears weren't so good in those days so I didn't I couldn't always figure out the chords by ear so I had to and I didn't use charts I didn't have anything like that so how did I I don't, I don't exactly remember I think um, what I did well I do remember one thing that I did is in, in those days there was one guy who was actively playing the style one guy and a few others and his name is Francois Rousseau salut Francois and um, every summer oh, not every summer every every weekend he was playing this little cafe and I spent my entire summer going to going to that cafe just to watch him play to to make sense of uh, this Django style that's where I learned uh, a bunch of songs I don't remember if he taught me any songs but I do remember just paying attention to the chords he was using to the songs that he was playing so that's how I expanded my my first batch of repertoire so I learned a whole bunch of tunes that way and then for soloing I, I just like the scale and arpeggio approach just didn't work it didn't sound right to me so what I did um, well I was already doing this I was listening to a lot of Django but then I started to I noticed that Django would have would use certain par patterns regularly I, I noticed them and I remember one of my first breakthrough moments was um, learning Django's minor blues solo from 1940 I learned the entire solo but more importantly I I uh, concentrated on a few patterns that he liked to use and he never played them exactly the same way so what I did is I took the pattern and I simplified it so one of the patterns was something like he, he might play it something like this or so something like that so what I did, I, I took that, I saw that, okay, it's, it's over a G minor chord. Yeah. And I simplified it, I just turned it into this. And I noticed that sometimes Django would, instead of playing the note E natural here, he played F natural. So yeah. I, I took some of his lines, his ideas, his patterns, and I simplified them. That's what I did. So I learned a few licks for different chord types, minor, major, dominant, dominant and major, dominant and minor. And over almost all the standards, that's kind of how I improvised. Copy, paste, copy, and paste, because I didn't know any better. That was the best I could do to kind of sound correct in the style. And even though it's it, the solos were not my solos were not always creative they suddenly sounded right in the style rather than the arpeggios and scales that I was mindlessly playing and this system of improvisation is very similar to my friend Christian van Hamert's uh, system he calls it the van Hamert system it's very 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 similar and if you don't know Christian check out his YouTube channel he's like a YouTube star or something and uh, yeah so that's that's how I started I was just making my own licks based on Django's ideas and not just Django in those days there was also Stokolo Rosenberg and Jimmy Rosenberg uh, you have to understand that in those days gypsy jazz wasn't what it is today if it is even anything but there were very very few players very few active players and Jimmy and uh, Stokolo were the the main the main players that were really active on the international scene this is just right before Rarely came out with his Gypsy Jazz project, and that changed everything. So it actually went on like this for a number of years. I kept learning more and more patterns, and I simplified them so that they they were easy to digest. And eventually, I also subconsciously started copying some of Django's mannerisms. 
And I say subconsciously because I wasn't even aware of it until I started teaching other people to play the style. They, they use the same technique, play the same phrases, but it didn't sound the same. And that's because they weren't doing some of these articulations that I somehow miraculously subconsciously copied. You know, things like this. The vibrato, these little... Or like this ghost note. Or some of these... Now, check it out. And also not, not just the, on the left hand, but also on the right hand. Everything, the sound. Like sometimes you play softly. And kind of, oh, you can hear over the sound hole, but sometimes you'd be more aggressive. And he'd vary the picking a little. I can't play too loud because we're in Tokyo. Everything is very small. The neighbors are just 10 feet away. And it's kind of cold here because I turned off the heater so I could record the audio without any noise. Don't worry, I don't have the coronavirus. So when I became aware that I was doing all these little mannerisms, they're, they're kind of like accents. I, I, I came to realize how important sound was because when I would listen to other players who played really, really well but didn't do some of these things, I, it's just like something was missing. And it, it was this. So when, when you listen to your favorite players, it doesn't have to be Django, it can be anyone. Try to listen to the way they articulate the notes. The timing of the notes, how short do they play the note? Like if I play a quarter note, or the accent with the, the right hand, things like that, vibrato, uh, the timing, do, is it straight eighths, swung eighths, slightly swung, laid back, I had things like that, try to pay attention to that, the way you articulate like sometimes you want to play or no vibrato then vibrato how big a vibrato things like that try to really really pay attention you can just take one recording and spend maybe like two three hours trying to paying attention try to try to pay attention to these very very subtle details and you realize that interpretation matters so anyway, this kind of what I was doing for a number of years. A number of years passed by, and I did the best that I could. And I'll be the first to admit that it wasn't very easy being self-taught. Um, actually, it's very, very difficult. And the breakthroughs that I had in music, they were spread over many, many years. Like the progress that I made in, I don't know, six years, most people would probably do, would make, <coughs> sorry, in one or two years now because you have so many resources you have YouTube you have all these teachers you have all these festivals and books and everything I, I, I really wish I had that but no for me everything was was a slow process I was on my own nonetheless I still managed to make some progress and eventually I realized I was starting to hear the music in my ears what do I mean by that? So basically, I had learned so many songs, hundreds of songs, both the melodies and the chords. And I could put on a record, like, I don't know, Stoklo, and I would listen. I'd, I'd understand what he was doing. Not only understand, but I could also see in my head where he was playing these lines. And sure enough, I'd grab my guitar and just, boom, reproduce note for note what, what he was doing. And this happened because I learned to listen to music very carefully. And that's when I came to understand music as a language or improvisation music improvisation as a language if I were to ask you how did you learn your mother tongue you probably wouldn't be able to answer that easily right because you'd say oh, I learned it from my family from my parents yeah but how did you learn just like that you just absorbed it you were surrounded by it and eventually the next thing you know you were starting to speak it I kind of speak by feel whatever language that I know how to speak it's always I always speak it by feel and I think that's the same for many of us we don't necessarily know the grammar or are experts at it certainly not me but we speak whatever languages we speak fluently and actually English is not my first language I learned to speak English by watching TV the words that I'm using now, how well, how do I choose them? They just they just come out. And it's the same with music. I realized from listening to music, 
um, so so carefully I, I I just start to hear things for example if I'm playing a tune like I don't know G major <laughs> I just hear it and uh, it's just because I listen to music carefully this is the result it was it was an accident I didn't deliberately set out to be able to do this but it just happened on its own because all those years spent uh, listening attentively just automatically gave me this skill kind of like a baby doesn't s purposely choose to speak its mother tongue it just happens so that was an accidental gift from Django it was an accident so it's all about careful listening not just casual listening that everyone does anyway and that means listening to every single part like what the bass was doing what the harmony was doing what this instrument every, every single part listen to the articulation the accents the ornaments uh the notes the rhythms and everything and trying to somehow make sense of it in by feel right now i'm studying japanese that's why i'm here in japan but if i could if i say tanjoubi omedetou gozaimasu and i say this every day all day for i don't know a whole month Eventually, you'll probably be able to repeat it. Tanjoubi omedetou gozaimasu. But in this whole month that I'm saying this to you, if I don't explain to you what that means, it's just sound. And it makes it very hard to also remember what I'm saying because you, you have, there's no connection, there's no meaning to this expression. Tanjoubi omedetou gozaimasu. This example is as if you're listening to music in another language, Japanese. And you even manage to find the lyrics on the internet and uh, with no translation. So you manage to, the phonetically, to repeat the words, but you have no idea what you're singing about. You're probably singing about how you had diarrhea yesterday. And um, so that's the key difference. So now I'm going to teach you what Tanjoubi Umedetou Gozaimasu means. It basically means happy birthday. So now this expression has meaning, and you know in which context you can use it when it's your friend's birthday. Tanjoubi omedetou gozaimasu. So that was exactly how what it was like for me when I was learning Django's lines. I didn't always understand everything he did, but I was able to realize that okay, he played so and so passage, and it works over this chord progression. And then in another song, when that same chord progression would occur, I could do the exact same thing, but and it, it would work. The only downside of this is that I could only play the way I learned it because I didn't understand what, what was going on, so I couldn't really m manipulate it. So it would always be this copy and paste thing. And that's how it was for me for a number of years, kind of this Van Hamered system. So with Tanjoubi uh, Omedetou Gozaimasu, we know that it means happy birthday, but we don't know what the individual words mean. So now I'm going to break down Tanjoubi Omedetou Gozaimasu for you. You have the word Tanjoubi, which is the word for birthday. But within that word, you have two components. Tanjo, which is the word, I guess, for like birth, creation, and bi, which is the word for day. And I noticed that bi in other words, like yobi, like for the days of the week, getsu yobi, today is moku yobi, yobi yobi, it's the day. So, ah, oh, okay, that's where it comes from. So that's, you know, in common. You have the word omedetto, which is the word to, to congratulate someone. Congratulations. Omedetto. Uh, and I heard this word elsewhere. It's like when someone graduates from school, you say, Omedetou gozaimasu. Then you have this other word, gozaimasu, is the word that you use to make it polite and formal. So that gozaimasu, you probably heard it in arigato gozaimasu, um, which means thank you, the polite form of saying thank you. The word gozaimasu, therefore, is kind of optional. If you want to make it more casual, you can say, tanjoubi omedetou. Like say that to your your brother or your buddy, your best friend. And but now that you know the words at the cellular level, you can manipulate them. You can use them in different contexts. Uh, you can ask someone when. Now that we know that in tanjoubi tanjoubi omedetou gozaimasu, the word tanjoubi is birthday. You can use birthday separately. You can ask someone's birthday. Uh, tanjoubi wa itsu desu ka? 
when is your birthday things like that and that's exactly the same with music because I remember in uh, 2006 January uh, January 2nd or 3rd 2006 I know this because I was in London in a hospital waiting for my niece to be born and I was transcribing a Django solo and it was uh, the Rome sessions uh, Djangology so Djangology goes C sharp minus 7 flat 5 whatever you want to call it C minus 6 G over B B flat diminished over B flat diminished at one point Django does this I don't remember exactly the phrase but it's something like this F A flat D flat and if you just play those notes you would say oh it's a D flat major arpeggio what does D flat major have to do with B flat diminished I didn't understand it at all but I would play Django's I would I would use that lick over Djangology I knew it worked so I, I would use it over this progression rather G over B B flat diminished which is the same progression as so many songs it happens and I can't get anything but love so then there was an idea that I could use in that chord progression but I always played it exactly the same way like that because I didn't know how to manipulate it but as time went on I transcribed more and more Django I finally realized what it was it, it had to do with the context it was actually so over this G over B Django was thinking B minor 7 or B minor try it if you want it's a chromatic voice leading thing so Django is thinking so he's superimposing other chords so this actually B flat minor 7 over B flat diminished is quote unquote wrong but it's about the context he was superimposing chords so then finally I understood that lick at the cellular level and then I could do something like this right so that's the same thing and suddenly when you start to understand things like that at the cellu cellular level you can manipulate every single line that you play which is kind of what I do now like if I have a lick like this I could for example just start here or I could do or I can do see I can manipulate however I want because I understand everything not understand well I do understand the theory but it's 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 in my brain it's not really theory it's just I hear where I can go and I understand it's kind of like a feeling it's hard to describe so that was a huge huge thing for me another very important thing that I got from Django was is it, it's not something that I got immediately it's, it came over the over a number of years but was his how um, his sense of artistic intent everything that he did was deliberate whereas a lot of guitar players or instrumentalists they have a habit of doing things because it's the way they they learn how to do things like for example chords chord voicings and gypsy jazz often people play like the same chord voicings everywhere because it's the one that they know but with Django and I transcribed a lot of his rhythm playing too, his harmonies everything was so deliberate he didn't play chords because it was the one it was the voicing that he knew and you have to keep in mind that he also had a handicap so his technique was limited yet he purposely played everything with deliberate intent he would sometimes create these dissonances but it was always intentional and that's something that uh, that influenced me greatly to really think about the music rather doing th than doing things for the sake of doing them without really having any kind of meaning behind them I, I know it's very philosophical but it's something that uh, affected me profoundly and the final thing and probably one of the most important things that I got from Django and this again came much 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 later that I got from Django was his open-mindedness and his creativity he was always experimenting and looking for new sounds and there are some stories within the gypsy community the Manush community uh, Django was a Manush or Sinto if you want uh, so within that community uh, that culture is very very conservative and especially back in those days so Django was experimenting with like uh, contemporary in those days contemporary classical music and jazz and some people in his community didn't really appreciate it but Django didn't care he just wanted to like look for new sounds 
and that's something that I that I respect a lot. You know, the, in this style of music, we're playing jazz music, which usually means some sort of freedom. Yet it it can give the impression that everything is so codified that you have to play this way or it's not authentic. But Django wasn't thinking about anything like that. He was doing his own thing. He never sounded like anyone else. He took from all sorts of musicians. You can hear stuff from classical music. You can definitely hear a lot, a lot of uh, Louis Armstrong influence. But it was always in his own way. And he didn't care about whether he was breaking rules or not. He was just doing what he felt like doing. And that's that's something that I admire greatly. So that's the spirit of Django Reinhardt. So when I when I the one thing that I try to get from him is is really this spirit. I don't try to copy everything he does 100% because that's impossible. I'll never be Django. What I try to do is un understand the spirit behind his ideas. Um, so therefore, I'm I'm not interested in playing with two fingers. I mean, if that's what you want to do, go for it. I have my own thoughts about this. But for me, it's pointless for me to play with two fingers because I already understand Django's fingering system and I could do it just, well, better with three fingers or four. And actually, I can make a video about this two fingering system one day because there are a lot of misconceptions about his handicap and uh, from having studied his style for so many years, I've discovered some very interesting things about his fingering system that will blow your mind. So. So for me these days, it's more about this creative spirit than copying exactly, exactly what he does, what he did for the sake of copying. Now for me, when I, when I learn from Django, I, do, I, conscious, I make a conscious decision to take what I want to take from him now. So for example, this blues on mineur, a lick on C minor, minor blues, everyone plays this one. And I have to play quietly, so, but this is the fingering that Django used. he did it with two fingers but whatever and so people play it that way but for me I try to like explore where I can go with that so I can try a different fingering or or even oh Try different things up an octave. I try to be very creative in that way, and uh, it's something that's a bit recent for me because I've studied his uh, his fingering system so much that I'm quite familiar with it, and I try to discover new things nowadays. So that's what I want to say today on Django's birthday. Thank you so much to Django. Um, I owe everything, absolutely everything to you. Uh, I, I have no idea what I'd be doing today if it weren't for him. Uh, probably some sort of odd office job or something. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much.